Hello everybody, welcome back for another video. Hope you're all having a great day and that you are all doing well to start things off. The interest in buying Bitcoin appears to lag behind the cryptocurrency's price. A closer look at trending searches through the past months reveals that the phrase buy Bitcoin tends to increase in interest only after the price of Bitcoin has actually increased. Data from... <clears throat> Google Trends reveals that the search volume on the term buy Bitcoin in the past month have increased only after the price has moved upwards. As seen in the chart, the interest in the phrase peaked on the 3rd of April, hitting a score of 100 on Google. This is the peak popularity for the popular term in the selected period. On the same date, Bitcoin was trading around 5,300, which marked a considerable increase of only around, only, eh, around 26% from two days prior when it was trading at $4,200. There's that crazy chart right there. On the other hand, comparing both charts also shows us that interest in buying Bitcoin decreases if the price declines. In other words, it appears that people are more willing to buy Bitcoin at times when it's trending higher rather than when it's trending downwards. As Bitcoin is reported, this might indicate that people are just tempted to not miss out on a further increase in price, otherwise known as the fear of missing out or FOMO. The fact that the interest in buying Bitcoin declines when the price is plunging is perhaps another indicator supporting this type of behavior. I mentioned that before in another video. This was like a two or three weeks ago or something like that. I have always find it. I always find it. I have always found it rather interesting that whenever Bitcoin's price is low, like remember when we were at when Bitcoin was around was like thirty one hundred dollars. I kept on telling people, if you want to buy, just buy. There's no reason for you not to buy if you believe in the long-term prospects of Bitcoin. If you're here for more than 10 years, realistically, Bitcoin's price at that point, people believe it'll be over a million dollars. Not much of a difference between you buying at 3500 or you buying at 5000 because eventually what you are buying is going to be worth a million dollars. You're still making a huge amount of profit. <clears throat> and then I was talking about before we had another like article. This was, was months and months ago. Where they were talking about the actual like interest in the market for some reason was very, very low. And I said, it'd be really, really weird if people rather I came to the quick conclusion that people for some reason don't buy when the price is low. But when the price gets really high or when other people tell them to buy, like my theory that by the time <clears throat> that the cryptocurrency market, rather the Bitcoin price goes over 100,000. We're going to see a lot of advertising for like buying Bitcoin and getting Bitcoin. You should have some Bitcoin. And it's only after prices go up that people really start to pay attention. Um, quick side note, why not? You know, we're all here. Uh, I was talking with a couple of friends over the weekend. It was at least four or five different people somewhere around that range. And the topic of cryptocurrencies came up. And for some reason, it's really funny. A lot of people think that cryptocurrencies are dead. And I don't mean like people in the cryptocurrency space. I mean like people in the normal world, like those who don't follow crypto news, those who maybe even don't have cryptocurrencies themselves. A lot of people were telling me, they were like, oh yeah, that, 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 that's really cool that you're you're into that, but isn't it isn't it dead? And I was like, what are you talking about? They were like, well, you know, you don't, it's never on the news. People don't really talk about it. And then I explained to them like all the stuff that's happening, like with all the stock exchanges and all the banks and all the custody solutions. And they were like, I didn't hear any of that on the news. And I figure it's all because, at least in my opinion, that the uh, larger institutions are trying to buy up as much as possible before they make any news on the, or rather any noise on the actual news. <clears throat> Because what ends up happening is that as prices go up, more people then realize that they should have bought when it was lower. And then a lot of people start buying in, hoping that it'll go up later on after they've already bought. It helps the system. It helps the entire thing. Uh, it's a little annoying when people just don't buy right now. Like I was, why not? I was reading another article. I've been reading a lot. Uh, and they were talking about the scarcity of Bitcoin. And <clears throat> I think people are trying to actually mathematically... <coughs> Sorry again. Uh, mathematically trying to figure out exactly how many are left, how many are actually floating around out there. And I think the article was talking about that there are like 36 million uh, millionaires that we know of in the world, not including billionaires. And, you know, how there's, n there's not enough for each one of them to actually own a Bitcoin. But they were going into more specific numbers as far as like, these are locked up. This is with Gray Rock. This is with so-and-so. This is with blah, blah, blah. This is with so-and-so. And they were talking about like even individual people uh, who may own anywhere from like two to 10 Bitcoin who've been accumulating over the last like four, five, six, seven years, and that there's maybe only a good, maybe a million, maybe less somewhere around there actually floating around, <clears throat> and that the price of Bitcoin, according to them in that article, will probably 
uh, explode at some point, as many of the other analysts have been saying, because when we do get to a, a crucial price point, what's going to end up happening, around, and, that, and that means around, you know, when we start pushing towards that 20,000 again, people will go, oh my gosh, it's where it was before. Let me get in now, as opposed to 5,000, so I can make some more profit and I can show these people that I do have a Bitcoin and I do have all this money. As they start buying into it, other than richer people will realize, hey, there's, you know, the price is going up. It could potentially hit 50,000. I don't have a full Bitcoin. Let me try to buy a full Bitcoin. And then the other millionaires will kind of tumble into it as well. And then the other people who are even richer than them will say, why not? I'll buy five, six, seven of them. And this will cause a huge tumbling effect. And then eventually the idea is, is that Bitcoin will become incredibly scarce. And a lot of people are predicting that this event uh, of like hyper scarcity should start to begin sometime around 2020. That's next year when the Bitcoin reward gets cut in half because people believe that before that, the next what is it, like 18, 16 months or something like that, that the um, the frenzy will begin and people will start buying Bitcoin and the prices will then go up. And then eventually, as people realize that less Bitcoin are going to be made next year, more people will then end up buying. And then, yeah, kind of interesting, right? But the, the, the weirdest part is that for some reason, people only buy after prices are going up. Drives me crazy. I guess a lot of people, I don't know. Uh, I like to assume that it's people who are not in the cryptocurrency space and those who are uh, simply just maybe rehearing about it for the first time in a very long time. Because if, if you're in this space for, for the long haul, you should definitely, uh, like these, the, the, these many prices should not even bother you. You should just be accumulating, especially since we, like if we get to our, our rather, how do I put this into words? Bitcoin is still below 20,000, like anything below its all time high and you are still making money. That's kind of the uh, easiest way to put that into um, uh, words. <clears throat> Next up, results from a survey conducted by Global Custodian and its sister publication, The Trade Crypto, in partnership with blockchain security company BitGo, shows that endowments are one of the most active segments in crypto across all institutional investors including asset managers, pension funds, and hedge funds. The survey conducted in the fourth quarter of 2018 involved participation from 150 endowments. 94% of endowments surveyed that took the part in this actually in crypto. Um, how many, they, I'm not going to read out through all of that. They, they were talking about how many of them expect their, uh, their allocation in crypto to decrease. It was only 7%. How many allocation would it increase? I was 55%. So... <clears throat> The crypto appetite among endowments is decidedly more open to alternative, riskier assets than their traditional peers because of a long-term strategy, the author concluded. However, due to the crypto roller coaster ride compounded by a lack of regulations, exchange hacks, and ongoing controversy over how the new asset class can truly fulfill the role of money, sentiment is skittish. The idea is, is that everyone is interested in the space everyone is looking towards the space to see exactly where it ends up going this kind of ties directly into this uh, but a lot of them are only putting in certain amounts of money because they want to see exactly how far this is going to go but the really weird situation is that they're probably going to dump a huge amount of money once prices go back up again which is just kind of i mean it's kind of how things are going but the idea is is that we have metrics now to be able to calculate how many or rather, if there are a large amount of institutional investors, pretty much rich people who are getting into the cryptocurrency space, and it just seems that endowments are one of the largest uh, backbones of the institutional uh, crypto market. <clears throat> Next up, the Mayor Multiple, a measure conceptualized by diehard Bitcoin investor and evangelist Trace Meyer, seems to be signaling that Bitcoin might have bottomed as explained by analyst Crypto Kia, yeah, it's definitely not key. I'd say Kia. The multiple, which weighs the price and 200-day moving average <coughs> of Bitcoin, recently passed 1.0 after falling to 0.51 on the 14th of December. Here's a little chart right here. Kia claims that the simple fact that this might have just indicated the Bitcoin bottom of the bear market. The analyst looks to the fact that the previous market cycles, wherever the mayor multiple surpassed 1.0 after a calculation, a capitulation event, the bottom was in. Following the multiple moves past 1.0 came months of chop and range trading, which we saw these, that the whole, the whole sentence is really crazy. The point is, this is like the ninth time that we're getting from a lot of analysts who like deeply look into the cryptocurrency space and the cryptocurrency market, and even, I guess, more so for Bitcoin's price. Everyone is saying that it appears 
based on metrics. And, and what I find the most interesting as well, <clears throat> and this is just my opinion, bear with me. Uh, we've seen tons of charts. This is not the first chart that we've seen indicating uh, Bitcoin's price, the movements, you know, the bearish, the what was the other one that we had yesterday, like the fear index. And then we had another one that was like, uh, oh, gosh, what was it? It was it, it was some like oversold and undersold and underbought and under so and so. And then we had another one like a couple of days before that. Every single metric, many different metrics around there are showing uh, that Bitcoin probably bottomed out around this number, around three thousand dollars. That was it. Bitcoin does not want to go any lower. People are unwilling to push Bitcoin's price any lower than that. What I find the most interesting about, I guess, maybe uh, the behavior of people is that a lot of people tend to focus. You can have nine good things happening in your life and then one negative thing and people tend to focus exclusively on that one negative thing across the board. We've had tons of people come forward talking about this is my research. I've done it over the last three, four years. My research this is research is research, research, research. I've been analyzing this so and so and so and they all kind of indicate Bitcoin's price probably bottomed around $3,100, $30,000, $3,000. That was it. New highs. Let's go. Let's move there. <clears throat> we're almost at, uh, we're like 5,200 or something like that right now, but we still get a lot of people who are uh, obsessing over the fact that we could potentially uh, go back down in price. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, and another, yeah, it says, I don't know. Uh, it would seem to me and many other people in the industry that Bitcoin is probably not headed to $800 again. That's just how I feel. Uh, I And I've thought for a long amount of time, this is my own personal opinion. I feel like a lot of these people are now coming forward because they realize that the prices shouldn't be this low and that the, the, the bear market, air quotes, should not have gone on for this long. So I think it's them kind of trying to push people saying, hey... It's over. You should all be buying. Once again, that's my opinion, uh, because there are just far too many people on uh, normal crypto side and also on the institutional trader side. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Who are coming forward and telling people that the bear market is over. Yeah, I, I have to apologize for the thing. I mean, I'd rather not apologize for my normal bodily function, uh, but it's just really weird. Like it's not raining uh, my throat is dry. It's just not that you all needed to know that, but I thought I'd give an explanation as to why I keep clearing my throat because it's just not. And people are also gross. Like I was walking down the street and this woman like sneezed into the air and this guy like coughed on my hand as I was on the train. It, it, it just doesn't really make a lot of I, I, I don't understand uh, why this is happening. So anyway, I'm continuing to drink tea for those who uh, who cared to know about my life. Anyway. Next up, I found this one really, really interesting. Are those ants? I have no idea what that is. Anyway, the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, and the World Bank have jointly launched a private blockchain and a so-dubbed quasi-cryptocurrency. The Financial Times reported this a couple days ago. According to the newspaper, the asset called Learning Coin will be accessible only within the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The coin has no value and thus is not a real cryptocurrency, the Financial Times said. As the Financial Times has learned, Learning Coin was launched in order to better understand the technologies that underlie crypto assets. Its app will serve as a hub where blogs, research, videos, and presentations are stored. During the test, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund staff will earn coins for achieving certain educational milestones. Amazing. The institutions will allow them to redeem the assets gained for some rewards, which would allow them to learn how coins can be used in real life. Per the International Monetary Fund, the banks and regulators across the world have to catch up with crypto technologies that are rapidly developing. The Financial Times quoted the International Monetary Fund as saying, and I do quote, the development of crypto assets and distributed ledger technology is evolving rapidly, as is the amount of information, both neutral and vested, surrounding it. This is forcing central banks, regulators, and financial institutions to recognize a growing knowledge gap between the legislators policymakers, economists, and the technology, end quote. Uh, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Uh, it's kind of weird. And I, and, I, and I mentioned that because I felt, and I said it before, that I think that world leaders and world banks and world blah, 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 blah 
in their hearts and in their minds and in their souls thought that cryptocurrencies were going to disappear. It did not happen because I think what they were waiting for, especially since 2017, is that when they scared everyone and told everyone, yeah, we're going to ban it. Yeah, we're going to give you regulations that the market would completely collapse and they wouldn't have to kind of think about it again. And this is why I think the last couple of months have been very uh, significant for the cryptocurrency space in that we've seen multiple central banks come forward and saying, yeah, we, we've got to create our own crypto. And multiple normal banks as well are starting to come forward and saying that they're thinking about implementing blockchain technology so that they can kind of send funds faster. But it's funny that they're also like using this rhetoric now that they're using this kind of term. They're, they're saying it as, as if like they're, they're saying it as if. They had already planned to give you better services like a year and a half ago, but now is the time to release the information. So uh, I have felt this way for quite a long amount of time. I feel like that even in 2018, as prices were going down, I think a large part of the industry was either this is going to go somewhere or the other part was like, no, these things are definitely dead. And this is why I think I'm not naming countries. It's, and it's not the U.S. as well, uh, who were talking about giving crypto regulation for the 15 months. And they haven't done anything because I think they're they were waiting for it to die. They know it's not going to die. They realize that over this two year period, maybe even longer, that they have no idea what any of this was. Like, can you imagine being a world leader or someone who deals in international monetary financial policies and you hear something new that just came out eight years ago, two years ago, when Bitcoin was only eight and a lot of, you know, tech nerds and, you know, punks are using it and all this other stuff. And you're like, well, that's great. That's wonderful. It's not going to go anywhere because I rule the world. And then you realize that it is going to go somewhere and that other people is gaining traction very like, quick. I think there's like a million new users to the Bitcoin network every single month or something ridiculously crazy like that. So, uh, I mean, we know the, the, or rather it has been speculated for quite some time that there are ties I mean, we, we kind of know. Anyway, between the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and uh, the Ripple team. Uh, but I guess now maybe even they're trying to get more serious with it. I mean, it took them long enough. And I uh, hope that they actually learn something. And I mean that in like the most honest way, because uh, it seems as if <clears throat> crypto as a whole cannot move forward without their blessing or without their regulation. So I hope that they learn something from the learning coin, which is just a horrible name. I would I would have even accepted like bank coin, even banker coin, e even bankster coin. I would have uh, uh, liked a bit more than learning coin, but I do hope that they learn something. It's kind of interesting. And I can only imagine the other projects that are happening around the world that are very similar to this. Anyway, let's move on. To kind of finish things up, Ethereum Core, or just Ethereum, developers are considering implementing more frequent and smaller hard forks, according to the most recent bi-weekly meeting that they had a couple days ago. The question of time between hard forks, or network upgrades, was brought up by the meeting's moderator, Tim Baiko, who referenced it as an ongoing topic of discussion. Another dev then began the discussion by referencing Core developer Alexei Akunov's previously expressed position in favor of shorter period between forks. To check the temperature of the developer's position on hard fork timing, the dev asked if anyone on the call was open to hard forks as short as three months apart. The first three responses to the question were negative or tentative. Someone saying that three months was far too quick. Another developer, Martin Hostess Svenda, then summarized the sentiment by stating, as long as we're not tied to large hard forks every three months, so more like opportunity windows when things are finished. Another dev then pointed out that the team had yet to complete a hard fork within six months, suggesting that the couple of things were possible needed to automate to be able to do that really well. The devs also referenced the topic as being previously discussed on the Ethereum developer forum, Ethereum Magicians Amazing. In the discussion's initial post, posted on the 15th of March, Baiko laid out the pros and cons of smaller and more frequent updates, noting that the team had discussed a topic on the dev call that same day. Let's see if this actually ends up happening, and I'm, I'm not surprised at all that this is actually um, a discussion, because for those who were here, and remember, the Ethereum team had said that we were going to get upgrades on the Ethereum network starting around 2016, or rather they were beginning the implementation or they were starting the uh, framework or the thing going forward to be able to implement Constantinople uh, Plasma, blah, 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 Casper, so-and-so-and-so, -and -so, sharding, all these other things. And we only have Constantinople. So, um, as especially if you were listening to, um, I think it was, uh, I want to say unconfirmed, it's probably incorrect. 
Laura Shin, she has a podcast, and she had a podcast a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, where she was talking to Vitalik Buterin as if he thought, or questioning if he thought Ethereum was lagging behind. And he said no, but it, it was kind of like they feel like that they can do more, or like more can always be done to secure the network, more can be done to do so-and-so, more can be done to help people's funds. There's always something extra that can kind of be done, and I... Uh, three months might be a bit quick. I have heard through the grapevine, it is not the easiest thing in the entire world to be able to write code, especially very quickly, especially if you are trying to do something like that. Because the, the, I think the last thing <clears throat> that the Ethereum team wants is to, uh, how do I say this? And I guess the only real phrase, because it's, it's kind of the only one who really does it, is kind of, um... Bitcoin Cash it. Bitcoin Cash, the developer team recently announced that they were, I think, going to be implementing. I think it's, I think it's set in stone that they're going to have upgrades every six months. Part of the problem is, is that why the the Bitcoin, the number one coin, developers are so scared of doing these these upgrades is because they've had upgrades before in the past and they people have found like bugs in the code that would have allowed the printing of extra Bitcoin, that would have slowed down the network, that would have double spent it. Like it's, it's, it's always something that could potentially go wrong. So the idea is that for Bitcoin, number one, that you do these upgrades as slow as possible. You make sure that you have tested it, tried it, you know exactly that there's nothing wrong with it, you implement it on the network, good, let's go. Uh, it would be interesting to see a uh, an Ethereum that was upgraded every six months or even every three months, you know, uh, whether that be changing the the amount of transactions going through the network, changing like other small things for more security, like just changing little tiny things. Because usually we've seen before in the past, whenever you have an upgrade, the price tends to go up. Uh, but on that other flip side, this is not me talking down to the team. It has taken them quite a few uh, years to be able to upgrade to the upgrades that we have right now. We're still missing about five of them on the network. And I think if they started pushing those a lot quicker, I think it could put a bit more pressure on them and they may have a higher possibility of making mistakes on the network. But I think that they're also doing this, at least in my opinion, because they're trying to keep up with those who have declared themselves to be competition with Ethereum. We have Tron, we have Cardano, we have EOS. These are the main <clears throat> three that people tend to focus on, at least right now. Um, and when you have a situation where people are testing these blockchains and they're doing five to 10,000 transactions per second and people are moving their, uh, games and stuff like that over to these other platforms and they're not having any hiccups, no slowdown and stuff like that as well. I, I mean, we'll see how this develops. I think it would be great in theory if we could have a constantly evolving upgrading Ethereum. Uh, but the risk of something in the code being incorrect, something being wrong, someone manipulating the 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 network and, and there's you know there's a thousand different things that could happen uh but ethereum is still one of my favorite coins i'm still rooting for it um even if it's uh not to where we expected that it would be right now all right everybody yeah my throat is i, I mean it kind of is what it is like I, I can't apologize for it it's not really my fault i'm doing everything that i can uh, to try and feel better. I mean, I feel fine. It's just like this really weird twinge in my throat and it's kind of driving me completely insane. Um, but at least I'm able to actually talk and make videos because that was one of my major fears. But I think I have to start taking it a bit easier. Maybe not pumping out like three videos a day. That might be uh, <clears throat> better for my throat. Anyway, uh, prices are okay last night bitcoin was around like it was 4989 or something like that it popped back over 5000 clearly indicating that 5000 is a huge level of resistance uh we had a lot of news and i guess why not like i said we're all here there, there, there's so many times when i i think i want to say stuff and i'm like no 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 they, they don't want to hear this and i'm like they probably want to hear it uh for those who weren't here yesterday we had news that binance is going to be uh, officially delisting uh bitcoin cash satoshi's vision from their platform as such, you may see right here that the price has completely, uh, I want to say collapsed, uh, but it has gone down. And money from that, people were selling their SV and pumping it into Bitcoin Cash. And Bitcoin Cash actually ended up passing Litecoin and EOS to get to the number four position. And at a certain point, there was a lot of speculation floating around uh, that Mr. Wright... Uh, who claims that he is in possession of a large number of Bitcoin, has started to sell off his Bitcoin in an angry 
push, like I said, speculation. Find this on forums. You find this on Twitter. Uh, even in my comment section, people were mentioning as well that Craig may have been selling off his Bitcoin in an angry move to try and push the price down. Uh, and this maybe is why we saw a price... Because it's really weird because as Binance announced that they were going to delist it, the market was actually green. And then the market was actually remaining green. And like yeah, good five, six, seven hours later, there was a, a, a very random push little little dip right right here into the red and then speculation began to ensue uh, about what was going on who knows a bitcoin seems to be very resilient uh above the five thousand dollar mark we just need something to push it above i think it's like 50 to 50 300 then apparently we will uh be on safer waters if i can kind of say that uh anyway uh what's very interesting as well right now is that uh and i mean i'm Maybe it's just me. I've become quite frustrated the last couple of days uh, looking at the volume of certain coins. I saw Tether's volume. It's Tether. No one should really be surprised that it has 11 billion. Like, Tether's volume is higher than Bitcoin. No one, this, this should not surprise anyone. Everyone's losing their freaking minds right now because of that where the market is going. A lot, a lot of trading is happening. Uh, Bitcoin's volume is 10 billion. Ethereum's is 5.2. Bitcoin Cash's is 2 billion. EOS is 1.8, Litecoin is 2 billion as well, and it's a lot over here to XRP, you guys know I have a, a very large soft spot for XRP, the volume the last couple of weeks is really driving me insane, I don't understand why the volume is constantly so low, um, I don't know, I don't get it, can't really say, uh, but yeah, I was looking at it yesterday and I was trying to figure out or like look for like significant news or something like that. And I just couldn't find anything. And I was like, maybe it's just sleeping. Like, I don't know what else to say about the volume of XRP and why it's just not as high as the coins that are uh, wrapped around it. Anyway, I think that is definitely going to do it for this video. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Hope you all are having a great day. A great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I'm going to have some tea and then probably get back to work because crypto never sleeps. As always, a very special thank you to my Patreon supporters. <clears throat> they are Professor Wally from Gunbot University, SC Verzily Fine Art, Brady Neals, L. Doug, Jared Schneider, Wise Night Owl, Shaolin Fried Rice, Gil Boa Snake, Crypto Joe. Carl Birchinoff, singer-songwriter Mike Savitz, Rai Rai, Yasha Harari, Amy Starsheen, Jeffrey Ramsey, Crip Nodic, Crypto Artist Coldy 3D, Nicholas One Earth, One Piece, One Love, Setsuna, Nick Kanaya, Richie Rich the Third, RF Dusty, Cody, Vlad the Impaler, Paxis, Jeff Jeremy Fox. Why do I keep I always mess up on Jeremy Fox? I apologize. I was I always want to say like Jeffrey Fox. Jeremy Fox. Jim Gardner, Minting Coins, Arthur Yaku, and Nick Mangialavori, and Anthony Charles. Thank you all an immense amount for your support. I appreciate every single one of you. And yeah, I'll talk to you all soon. See you.